Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. I'm happy to welcome back our friend David Morgan of The Morgan Report and author of the fabulous new book, The Silver Manifesto. We don't get the opportunity to do face-to-face -face interviews all that often, but David is here in person in our Idaho headquarters facilities, and we're doing this from our little recording studio. So first off, David, welcome, and thanks for joining us as always, and, and thanks for paying us a visit. Mike, great to be with you, and thank you for the tour. It's uh, quite a facility, brand new, or I guess less than a year old. And I've been through you know, more than one of these, and I have to say you've thought through everything on a security basis as well as any I've ever seen. Well, thank you very much for uh, for the feedback there. We we certainly appreciate that, and it's great to having you here. So uh, before we get into the book, which I definitely want to cover with you today, uh, which is a fantastic read, by the way, I, I wanted to have a little bit of your background as a primer because obviously your experiences had a lot to do with the creation of this book. So how did David Morgan come to be so fascinated with silver? Where and how did it all start for you? Well, in my first book, Get the Skinny on Silver Investing, I wrote that when I was 11 years old, that the coinage changed from 90% uh, silver coins to what we call the Johnson Slugs. So that caught my attention, but uh, certainly at that point in my life, I had no idea what I'd be doing at this point in my life. And it's something I sort of didn't really forget about, but didn't pay much attention to. After all, I was 11 years old. But I was fascinated by money and markets, even as a small youngster. And when I was 16, I asked my dad if I could start trading stocks, and I actually was uh, allowed to do so. There's a form, I don't even know if it exists anymore, called the Uniform Gift to Minors Act. If your parents signed it, then you were allowed to trade stocks under the age of 18. So I started doing that, and I, on my own, started looking into monetary history and what money was and all this stuff. So I discovered very early on about the goldsmiths and how they loaned out, uh, these, or put out certificates that didn't have a one-to-one -one correspondence to the amount of gold that they held because they discovered that maybe one out of ten people came in to actually claim the certificate for gold. So the whole fractional reserve banking, how it was founded. So I became very fascinated about banking and fractional reserve banking and how the system really worked, and I knew most of the stuff by the time I was like 17 years old. So when I had some money. I got my first job, real job. I mean, I worked summer jobs. When I got my first real job and started saving money in a serious way, I started looking at the precious metals and primarily gold because it seemed from you know what I'd read to that point in time that gold was the best place to be. And as I saw the uh, first bull market in gold from the early 70s through January 21st, 1980, I was pretty much gold focused. And then after the fall of that time frame and silver pulled back substantially and so did gold, I asked the big question, why did the Hunt brothers buy silver? Why didn't they buy gold? What were they so interested in about silver? And then knowing later, not at that time, that Bunker Hunt felt the correct ratio between silver and gold was five to one. And during the peak of the silver market, it actually hit the 16 to one monetary ratio very briefly that one day when silver peaked. So I started looking at silver. And the more I read, the more I studied, the more I developed uh, you know, a study of silver, the more it became apparent to me that although more volatile, it held far more potential than gold. So when I you know, came into the business I'm in now and got on the internet and stopped just consulting and decided to start you know, writing a newsletter, uh, it definitely was silver-focused for a lot of reasons, but primarily just because of the background that I had through experience in the gold market and subsequent what I'd learned and studied about the silver market you know, post-1980. Not that I didn't have any silver exposure in the first run-up. I did, but I was, again, primarily focused on the gold market until after the fact. In the months leading up to the release of the Silver Manifesto, I recall you saying that this is the book you've been wanting to write for several years, perhaps even since you wrote uh, your best-selling Get the Skinny on Silver Investing, so it truly was years in the making, and it's incredibly comprehensive. You and co-author Chris Marchese go through all aspects of silver, from its history as a monetary metal, the industrial component, and the drivers there, and now the huge amount of investment demand that has developed over 
the recent years. It truly is the Bible on all things silver. So I imagine that even you, the silver guru, as, as many people refer to you as, probably learned something about the metal that you didn't know. So uh, talk about the book and, and give the audience who hasn't yet had a chance to read it an idea of what it's all about. Well, certainly I did. I learned uh, a little bit more about the potential for silver in the electronics realm, this uh, LED lighting, this light-emitting diode. Uh, Chris did a lot of research on that. Uh, so there were several areas in that aspect of the book. And one of the things I learned was how difficult it is to write about the bullion banking, fractional reserve banking, and basic economics in a manner that hopefully is lively, but more difficult is to write it in a manner that people, one, will read it and understand it. Because without an understanding of basic economics, and most people, as soon as you say the word, they, you know, it's like taking a couple of uh, sleeping pills. They're ready just to, <laughs> to nod off. And I get that. But it's critical to understand it, to really have a solid basis, basis or foundation to understand why precious metals are so critical, especially during this time frame that we're currently living. So that is the biggest challenge. I think we rewrote those chapters like four or five times, tweaking them here, tweaking them there, trying to make them better, trying to make them more understanding, not over-explaining anything and not under-explaining anything. So the nine months, I think probably those three chapters were the ones that we just continually pounded again and again and again. And, of course, you look at the Amazon feedback, most of it's very positive. There's a few people that, you know, it's hard to read or whatever. And I get that. You know, it's not a book for a super intellect by any stretch of the imagination. We try to make it uh, readable for everybody. But there's some people that would read it that would probably find it difficult. And it is more of a textbook type of a book than perhaps, uh, you know, a novel of some type. But it's not a novel. It's about the silver market. It's about money. It's about monetary history. It's about the economy. It's about why we're where we are and what we can do about it. It's about choosing a mining company, how to an, analyze a mining company. It's about um, how to set up a profile in a portfolio where you manage risk to reward, why top-tier mining companies are more important in some ways than junior mining companies, why junior mining companies offer more exposure to risk than others. And so on and on it goes. I mean, basically, with Chris's help, it's it's what I've accumulated in 40 years of experience that I put in a book. So, yeah, there's a lot of heart and soul in it. And certainly I wanted to leave, and I don't like to use the word legacy. I'm just another human being, one out of seven billion on the planet. But I've certainly devoted my life to understanding money, metals, and mining. And that is, you know, what, this book gave me the opportunity to present, let's say, the cream of that into a format that hopefully will have, you know, a fairly decent sh shelf life. Well, I think you've definitely struck a good balance there between uh, the readability and the uh, the educational uh, aspect of it. It's, it is it uh, is a fantastic piece of work, so you guys did a, a very good job with that. Uh, you touched on the miners there, and as you more than anyone know, the mining industry has had a, a rough go of it over the last few years, given the extended period of low prices. Uh, but the mining stocks seem to have finally based out and, and maybe have rebounded from their lows. So are you seeing a leading indicator of a new bull cycle in the physical metal, perhaps? And, and what are, what about mining stocks? Is it safe to get back in? Well, I think it is safe. And, you know, we've been a little early there because this bottoming process has taken so long. A lot of the stuff that we have recommended is uh, value-oriented and is still value. And now it's more, you know, it's a better value because it's lower in, in price. But your direct question, there's a direct answer. Uh, on the premium service, all the videos that we do, so when I do like a mining trip and we shoot a video of it, or, or David Smith or Chris, uh, we try to do a film and we post that to our premium members. And then I also do like look over my shoulder trades where I use the Camtasia software and I say look at this chart or, or whatever. I mean, I can show anything with that from the desktop. And I recently showed a chart of the HUI and how their bottoms are higher the three bottoms that we've seen, each one has been subsequently higher than the last, which is a small, very visible uptrend, which is unusual because gold and silver certainly have sold off this, um, you know, recently. And it's in this, what I call indecision pattern, it's in our channel formation. If it breaks out to the upside, you know, we might be on our way, although it'll probably take a couple more tries. And if it breaks to the downside, usually it only takes one trip through the downside, unfortunately. Markets go down easier than they go up. So if it were to break the channel, gold and or silver, you'd probably see a new low. 
Hasn't happened yet. I don't think he will. But the stocks are a great leading indicator in a bull market, and right now the HUI is signaling that. It's saying that uh, the bottom is in and that we're going higher. It doesn't say we're going higher tomorrow. It doesn't say it's going to be zooming up by the end of the year, but it does indicate the bottom is in and better times are ahead of us. So that's how I read it. I don't argue with the markets. That's what it says right now. Could this be a false indicator? Yes. Do these work 100% of the time? No. But it's a very reliable one. Uh, So that's what I'm going on. Uh, It's over several months, and I think that, uh, again, that uh, the worst is behind us. I certainly hope so at this point. Prices on the physical seem to be at artificially low prices, well below the all-in cost of production, which you often write about. Uh, around the uh, the last time you were on, the CEO of a primary silver miner called First Majestic, a very well-known one, had just urged other mining companies to follow his lead and hold back some of their production from the market, choosing instead to sell it uh, later when prices were not depressed or suppressed, I guess we could say. Uh, has the idea of putting a squeeze on all those leveraged short sellers gotten any traction from uh, other companies, or is it mainly just First Majestic at this point? Well, at this point, I would say it's probably just First Majestic. But if you go back in the history, um, Gold Corp had the situation. And of course, it's a gold company, but they were holding back production and banking it in a vault. So a shareholder in the early days of Gold Corp owned gold bullion and the shares in the company itself. And I was urging other silver mining companies to adopt a similar uh, manner of doing business. Two actually adopted it in a rather minor way. One was Silver Standard. They did that for a little while. And Endeavor Silver also did it for a short time frame. But Keith is really the one in present day that's done it, not only recently with what you outlined, but also Ted Butler came out recently and urged people to write a letter, urged mining companies to write a letter to the CFTC and uh, explain that these markets, the way that they are traded, are well outside of the realm of what the intent of the law is. And Keith did a great job. It's First Majestic. I mean, this is an NYSE company, symbol AG. Uh, I own the stock, by the way. I should get that in there. But it's um, it's a step forward. And if others will follow or not, I do not know. But I admire Keith. He's always been let's say, outside the box of most of the uh, CEOs I've met in the space. And that goes from, you know, top tier, which his company definitely is, to even the mid-tiers and the juniors. A lot of them just don't really want to get involved. Um, and I get that. It's it's easier to do nothing than to do something. And there's various reasons, and I'm not going to tell anybody what they should do or shouldn't do, but I really admire the fact that he stepped to the plate and did it. So it's uh, a lead move. And we'll have to wait and see if it has any bearing as far as what the response will be from the authorities. But I'd certainly love to see what, if he gets a response, what it is. Yeah, you certainly have to commend him for, uh, I guess, sticking his neck out in, in some way. And uh, definitely like to see him recruit others in, in the uh, the mining space to, to do the same, just so we can hopefully get away from some of the shenanigans that take place in these futures markets that are, are really hurting some, some real companies out there. I mean, you see it firsthand. Obviously, we've got uh, mining companies have had a, a very difficult time, or some of them anyway. Uh, do, do you do you expect to see uh, any more consolidation in that industry? Uh, what, what are you seeing there, and, and what's the mood like? Well, the mood is you know, pretty, pretty down. I mean, a lot of these miners have, you know, been suffering. Some have gone out of business. Some are moving together into one office space, two or three companies in Vancouver for the smaller companies. Uh, Thompson Creek is basically on care and maintenance, although they don't talk about it in those terms. I think they laid off like one third or two thirds. I forget which of the workforce. So you're seeing a lot of consolidation, cutbacks, uh, slimming production, and then a lot of companies have high graded in order to stay in business, and that's typical in these downturns. That companies, if they can, not all of them can, will go into the mine, and they know where you know the grades vary, and they'll get the highest grade because it's got it's the richest ore, and therefore your loss is less, or maybe you're still managing to eke out a small profit. But that weakens the overall um, ability of the company when things come back because your overall grade strength has been lessened because you've high graded. So there's a lot of things in the industry that have been you know, rather bleak for quite some time. I think we will see further weakness, but not much longer. Again, I'm trying to be as objective as I can, meaning that 
I think the bottom is in. I think the worst is probably behind us. I don't think we have much further to go. So I think anyone that's held on this long will probably make it over the hump and we'll start seeing better times for the miners. Having said that, I could be wrong. It's possible that with what's going on in the greater picture, and I'm sure asked me during the interview of, you know, the bond markets and the the Greek exit situation and all that is happening, that we could see some weakness in the main commodities uh, and also strength in the precious metals. For example, you might see weakness in uh, some of the base metals, uh, maybe moly, uh, maybe copper that's showing a little bit of strength here, fall back off. And then some of the other softs in the commodities come off, but food going up. I mean, we've got this problem with this uh, bird flu again. There's been a lot of depopulation of the chicken supply and egg supply. That will cause prices to ra- rise in eggs and uh, chicken. So you're going to see these things where, you know, I, I don't think I coined the term, but I certainly emphasize it, that the dynamic change is primarily going from things that you need will cost more and things that are debt-based will cost less or at least be able to be obtained. So you can look at the housing market. It's still bubblish in some sectors. Car loans are easy to get. Both those are debt-based uh, purchases, but food is not a debt-based purchase in most cases. It's, uh, you know, buy it, need it, and food prices certainly are not going down. Uh, that's a need. So, again, I, I'll say it one more time. Things that we need are probably going to cost more overall, things that we don't necessarily need, but we continue to purchase, especially on leverage, will continue probably to uh, at least uh, vary and oscillate, and the banks will give these loans or whatever, uh, they're getting lighter or easier to make purchases using credit than it has been for some time. Touching on the bonds, I do want to ask you about that. Obviously, all markets are tied together in some way or another, and perhaps one of the linchpins is, is the bond market, and a lot of trading activity is is uh, dictated off of what happens there. Uh, now, you had some interesting things to say about that when we were talking earlier at lunch. Uh, so what is the bond market telling you right now? What are you seeing there? Well, interest rates are reciprocal of bonds price. So as interest rates go higher, bond prices go down. And we have seen the bond market sell off, meaning that the interest rates are forced higher. In fact, the German bond is at 0.9% now. And it hasn't sold off as hard as it has recently until October of 1998, when the hedge fund long-term capital management imploded. And early on in my speaking career, uh, I talked about the Trillion Dollar Bet, which is a movie all about the long-term capital management fiasco. So that's a big indicator. The other one, of course, is uh, Mario Draghi talking about spooking the markets because he talked about preparing for higher volatility. And that's due to the Greek situation. And so the inflation in Europe, is that part of it? Yeah, it could be. But certainly this debt uh, crisis, this debt crisis with Greek, is really boiling over. I mean, everyone knows that they're missing this payment with the IMF, and that's something that hasn't happened ever, as far as I know. So all these things, Mike, are coming to the fore. The debt markets are the problem. They continue to grow, and yet... uh, At this point in time, they are probably the most unsafe place you can be for your money. And I want to digress for a moment because I've been through so far this bull market that I think will continue to be a bull market eventually. But I went through the full cycle in the 1970s to 1980. And the best move you possibly could have made, and I didn't do it, but hindsight's 2020, is that you sold your gold in January of 1980. And you bought the long bond, and I think it was like at 20% or so at the time, and you held that for 30 years. You could not have done anything smarter than that. But you know what? No tree grows to the sky. Kicking the can down the road, eventually you run out of road. And this is the time where you've got to rethink that fabulous move that some people made. That's wearing out. Bonds are supposed to be the safest investment you can make. But all these sovereign debts, which means nation states, cannot pay back their bond debt. And because of that fact, 
you have to really rethink if bond if bond investment is safe or not safe. And most of the bond market revolves around big money. It's bank to bank, nation state to nation state. I mean, Germany doesn't want to see Greek default because they've loaned them all this money. That's a nation state. So what happens in the next round, in my very studied view, will be it won't be corporate debt that fails. It won't be real estate debt that fails, although both of those could be repercussions. It'll be governments that fail. And how does a government fail? A government fails when it's sovereign debt cannot be paid. And this is what is taking place with Greece as we speak. And what are the ramifications? Can a nation state with, what, 12 million people, I think that's correct, uh, fail? But that systemic risk that triggers what happens in Germany, which triggers what happens in the rest of the euro market, uh, does that trigger what happens in London? And does that trigger what happens in New York? You bet it does. They're all interconnected. And because they're all interconnected, a small failure like 12 million people that can't be pay back the debt that they owe uh, could have repercussions far greater than just that one country. So that's what we're facing. And that means that we're in a situation that's far more precarious than we were in 2008. One of the other things we were talking about offline was uh, just the fact that we, we do have kind of two camps right now, the inflation camp and the deflation camp. I know you, you travel on all these conferences and you run into a lot of uh, smart people who have a lot of uh, really informed decisions and, and uh, opinions on, on uh, what's going to happen there. Uh, where do you fall on that? Uh, what, what do you think uh, the way out of this is? Are we going to have a deflating default or, or are we going to have an inflationary event here that, that takes place? Where do you come in on that? Well, there's really two main ways to have a depression. There is a debt liquidating depression, which is what we saw in the 1930s. And there is a hyperinflationary depression. And before I give you my final answer, <laughs> I'll discuss the, the, likely, the likeness of both of them. In both those cases, you have high unemployment. You have high un uncertainty about the economy. You have a high mistrust of government or government officials or authority in general. You have a general malaise of the populace. You start to see areas of need or want that are not uh, fulfilled very easily. For example, you'll find shortages in certain uh, supply lines, supply chains. So those things all happen, whether it's a hyperinflationary depression or a debt liquidating depression. The main difference is that in a debt liquidating depression, there's a huge contraction in the money supply and that money is more valuable than ever. In a hyperinflationary depression, the situation is that the government that holds the debt is able to try to print its way out of it, meaning that the money becomes worth less, worth less, and then it's eventually more or less worthless, where the trust of the people is actually uh, null and void. People don't trust the currency anymore, and it fails. The side I lean toward is that that's the way we're going to go, but I rule out a hyperinflation. You do not need a hyperinflation to have a currency crisis. That's not a requirement. So I do not believe in a hyperinflation because of the bond market. As interest rates are forced higher, bond prices go down, which is deflationary. However, it's a trust issue. So people will move to what they trust the most, which the first thing that they trust the most is physical greenbacks or their checking account or the money market account. So they'll move out of all of their asset classes. That will be stocks, that will be bonds, that will be master limited partnerships. There'll be anything that you could sell to somebody through a broker that you could sell and turn to cash. So that'll be the first run. The run will be to cash. And this comes to the extra pyramid, which you can look up on the internet. I've discussed it many times. And that will be perceived safety. However, that isn't the safest place you'll go. So as there are more debt defaults and more happen, there's a likelihood that there'll be a certain amount of that cash that runs to gold. And gold and silver are at the tip of the extra pyramid, meaning it's liquidity of all time and there's no counterparty risk whatsoever. You could liquidate a million dollar portfolio and stick it in the bank and feel very safe and then have what happened in Argentina happen to you, meaning that You've got the million dollars in the bank, and the bank won't touch it. They're not even going to do a bail-in. Hmm, okay, no bail-in. Well, David, I thought you said there could be bail-ins. Well, there could, but let's, in this case, say there isn't. However, 
the bank sends you a little notice that says you're only allowed to withdraw $200 a week from your account. Your million dollars is safe and sound with us, no problemo. However, the currency control mechanism set by the federal government now says that you're allowed $200 a week. Well, how would that sit with you? Not very well. At least I know it wouldn't with me. And this is exactly what took place. The idea is exactly right. The amount isn't correct, but the idea is exactly what happened in Argentina. So these are things people should think through. And you want to be outside of that before it happens. Will it happen? I don't know. Could it happen? Absolutely. Uh, Could a bail-in and a restriction on currency flows happen? Yes, both could happen. So the only way outside of that system is the money of all time. So coming back on point, and this is what I want to emphasize, we have never had a debt liquidating depression where the currency superseded and went on when it was not a gold-backed system. So let me restate that more succinctly. Every time you've had a non-backed currency and a depression, it has been of the inflationary variety. There is not one instance in history where it's gone the other way. So to say that it will go the other way is you're saying that the four or 5,000 years of recorded history, that for once, that paper money will trump gold. And I don't think that will be the case. It could be. I don't rule it out. I want to be um, consistent. As I've said, I've never ruled out completely that a debt liquidating depression could take place and that uh, you know currency itself actually goes up in value and, you know, does better than gold. I really don't believe that. I think you could have something of both happening at the same time, and I'll restate what I just stated but didn't probably emphasize it enough. You could see a run in the cash, and cash looks better than gold for a while, but then the ultimate money and the smart and smartest money moves into gold or at least hedges some of that cash into gold. And the gold market is so small that as that cash went from cash into the precious metals, you would see the metals come up and the dollar go down relative to each other. So that's what I really expect, a run to the dollar and then a run to gold, and that's kind of what we've been witnessing anyway. And again, the bond market can't hold forever. Interest rates will be forced up by the market. The Fed has a lot of control, but not ultimate control the market does. And eventually, we're already seeing the cracks start to take place in the bond markets, in, Euro, in the euro, in you know, the Spanish bond market, the German bond market, the U.S. bond market, and the trust level is starting to lessen. And it's just like going into a worthless paper, paper currency. It doesn't happen overnight. The 1913 dollar is now worth about four cents. and That took over 100 years. But at some point, it becomes worthless, and that's where we're heading toward. Does that mean absolute zero? No. We'll get a reset before we hit absolute zero. Well, it's certainly a crazy world uh, financially, and I'm glad that we have uh, studied and smart people like yourself to uh, help explain it all. And we appreciate you uh, coming on, and it's uh, great insights as always. It was uh, great to see you, and thanks for paying us a visit in person this time. My, My pleasure. Thank you. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to David Morgan. Again, the book is The Silver Manifesto, and I strongly urge everyone to pick up a copy of it. If you've ever bought silver, thought about investing in the bullion and mining stocks, ETFs, anything whatsoever, this authoritative book on silver is truly second to none when it comes to the silver market. It's available at moneymetals.com for $27.95 as well as Amazon. Pick up your own copy today. You definitely won't be disappointed. And check back here next Friday for next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.